Hey, 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 good morning, good morning. Welcome to the BKBK podcast where the sports and the culture collide and the New York Jets reign supreme. That's right. I'm Kerry Taylor and I'm joined by my brother Brian Joseph you. and Captain Kyle McKenna. No middle name. I was never given one. All right. Well, you don't deserve one anyway, but anyway. At <laughs> least <laughs> up in the front, not in the, in, in the back. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, our pitch man, Brandon Phillips, could not join us for the show today. Mm. But we will. Jerk. Um, he will be here next time. I think he's got some family responsibilities like we all don't have family responsibilities. But yep. hey. Exactly. Hey. Um. So we have titles for each of our episodes. Today's title is uh, Continued Evaluation. Mm. Evaluation of you name it, right? Right, right. the ball. You named it that because there has never been a football season like this one before. Nope. We need to continue to evaluate the potential threat um, of COVID-19 on the players and the staff and wonder if furthering this season is worth it. Also, with Sam Darnold out and Flacco in, Shout out to uh, Delaware University. Blue hands. Uh, Blue hands. That's right. We can we can continue to evaluate Donald um, by comparing and contrasting his play thus far versus Flacco's performance today. Lastly, the evaluation of um, our coach, Adam Gase. Um, yeah, it makes me want to throw up too. Puke. Uh, will the change in the practice habits uh, that were highlighted this week um, and the fact that the Jets are getting back, you know, one of their main weapons, um, will that allow for Gates to do a better job? You know, hey, let's talk about it. Where, where we are, where are we with this? Mm. So you want to cover COVID first, right? You got something to say, yeah, Kyle? We almost didn't have a game this week. Uh, I, I was expecting... Um, I was expecting that we wouldn't on Friday when um, when I woke up and saw the news that they had, you know, there's positive tests. Was it Friday or Thursday? Um, I thought it was yesterday. Uh, I th- no, I think it was, it was Thursday. It was Thursday because then Friday. No, no. No, because today's Sunday. I think it was Friday. It was Friday. 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 Yeah, it was Friday. It was Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So, so seeing that and then hearing that it was a false positive and that they're actually playing the game. I was actually really surprised that we still had a game because uh, you, you don't think that you don't think they're going to come back from something like that. Like with, I heard it was Gase that had, that had COVID and then a whole bunch of other people. And um, you know, with the way that COVID was this week with the president having COVID and, and, and then, you know, miraculously recovering I, I, I guess um the uh I didn't think that the mac- miraculous recovery of the Jets was going to happen in 24 hours so um I guess that's the thing with false positives did we do that um early on in this in the preseason didn't we have some false positives on our team and so kind of led to them retesting and recalibrating and then it was a whole bunch of um positive tests that turned out to be negative tests. Uh, and that, that happened like during the preseason or something, something ha- like that occurred, but yeah, you know, it, it, listen, it didn't impact the jets this week outside of them having to cancel uh, one of their practices, which obviously is, is impact enough, but right. you, you have the Titans, you have the Steelers, you have the bills. Um, you have the Patriots, you have the Broncos. Uh, a number of teams have been impacted by this either by having positive tests on their team themselves uh, or having to restructure their game schedules or postpones of games or buys being taken away and moved because of it. So, you know, COVID-19 is definitely starting to, to rear its, its ugly head um, in the NFL right now. And it's tough to, in my mind, to see all 16 games being played plus playoffs here, and all of that. Here's the thing. I think they anticipated that. I think um, the reason that they pushed to have the season start as close to on time as possible is because they could push it back um, a few weeks on the back end if necessary because of situations like this. So I think they they fully anticipated that this would, would occur. I mean, you're talking about when you compare it to basketball or baseball, you know, football has so many more people and moving parts that are sure. – that are, sure. 
um, that have to be considered. And um, especially when you look, when you compare it to, to, to basketball, I mean, you can't put, you know, that many staff members and players and personnel and coaches. Well, there's 22 it, starters, uh, right? And NFL has 22 starters. Basketball has five. Right. 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 Start, even we can baseball. start there. Yeah. yeah, you can start there. Even baseball, you know, with a, with with nine starters, you know what I mean. So, yeah, I I absolutely get it. Um, and when you so think about the, the preparation too, I was having the conversation with with wifey earlier. Um, when you think about the preparation for basketball or baseball, I mean, you could throw your five out there or your nine out there, and mm-hmm. there's not a lot of preparation, right? I mean, you right. know who's pitching a couple hours beforehand. And it's not really a big deal. But as far as football is concerned, every single week is a new challenge. It's a Mm -hmm. new team. It's a new defense, offense, Mm -hmm. skill, players that you're preparing for and stuff like that. So the NFL is totally different from that regard. And I don't know how you put a bubble together in the NFL because I think it's a little bit harder to to kind of put together. But I just feel like that was somewhat of a miss. I think we could have gotten in the NFL a little bit more creative as far as um, limiting some of their exposure, uh, what that looks like. I don't know. I mean, nobody would have thought of a bubble before the NBA kind of put it together and successfully rolled it out. Um, right. Now, the, the question is, do you put an asterisk on this season? And, and what I what I look at as far as the NBA and the Major League Baseball, um, do the players that are in the playoffs right now headed into potentially the World Series in another week or – you know, Jimmy Butler fighting for, you know, survival in the finals. They don't want to put an asterisk on their finals. So I don't think there should be any asterisk here on the NFL either. Um, to me, they roll themselves out. They want to play. They're warriors. And, you know, they'll challenge anybody to try to put an asterisk on any season that they try to, you know, put their bodies on the line for. So that's just my thought on it. Yeah, I I definitely think they all have to have asterisks next to them. I'll 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 make my case, starting with baseball, that the Houston Astros are about to be in the World Series, and they shouldn't. They were barred from the World Series, so the fact that um, the the fact that they're even playing in it means that it's an asterisk season anyway. Were they barred from the World Series? Golly. They were barred, they were weren't they barred from the postseason? Then why would they even play? I don't. Why I don't think that allowed them to away? play. You know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure exactly what the. I know that all the sanctions that were against, mm-hmm. um, that were against the Astros, um, didn't either didn't count or didn't count in the same way because mm-hmm. of this asterisk season. Um, baseball is playing five games in five days in five day, in five game series. I mean that's that's not. That's not the way you traditionally do things. Mm-hmm. Asterisks. Um, the the NBA bubble, um, whereas I think in a lot of ways the wobble and the bubble were really successful as far as uh, as far as like trying to keep the disease at bay and the pandemic. Um, you know there 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 were you know just the experience of it. Um, you know how can you really say that an NBA playoff series doesn't have an asterisk next to it if you don't have home court advantage. I think uh, I think that's why it shouldn't have an asterisk <laughs> because of the fact that there, is, there are no advantages. I feel like I feel like these guys were playing so much harder than they have been um, in the past. You know that what these guys do is they take games off, you know, during the season. You know, um, I forgot I forgot what the, the actual terminology is, but um, the Spurs, you know, used to do it regularly. Um, oh, load management is load yeah, management, that's right, that's right, right. Load management. And I feel like once they got into the bubble, I felt like that was some of the best basketball that I've seen in a long time during the, of the regular season, you know. It wasn't um, really a regular. It was the it was the tail end of the regular season. Right. I mean, it was almost like that. that it, was, regular it was the playoffs to get into the playoffs. Yeah. Well, and then listen, you cut out the fat, right? I mean, and the Knicks were part of that fat. You cut out the bottom eight teams. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. So, so you didn't want to see terrible basketball. So right. now you at least wanted to see above average basketball, which you did see. And there were a lot mm-hmm. of stars that kind of Jamal Murray, 
um, you know, stepped out into the, the spotlight during that mm-hmm. period of time. And like you said, Kerry, there were no advantage as far as home and away. I mean, you, you know, look at the, the Milwaukee Bucks, it. right? You think of, you know, how, how much their home court advantage is for them, and they got bounced early. They got um, bounced. Going back to your, to your uh, statement on Houston, so what their I'm sanctions was, right yeah, so their sanctions were general manager and their uh, coach were suspended for the entire 2020 season. Um, they were fined five million dollars and forfeited their first and second round draft picks in 2020 and 2021. That's it. So they weren't. Okay, so they, all right, I was wrong about that. Yeah, they weren't th- banned from the postseason, but um, and and hopefully the Rays beat them. Not that I love the Rays and have any Ray have any love for them, but um, I mean I definitely don't have any love for the Astros. But anyway, I, I listen. I, I I think that look at the personal side of things. Normally, if you play a game in the NBA, NFL, well, in the NBA, the bubble, let's talk about that. Um, you get to go home to your family, like your entire family, friends, all of that, and the support system. Um, you get to do some extracurricular activities that, you know, um, you know, keep you fresh and coming back and, and excited to come back to the gym. They didn't have any of that, right? I mean, they were talking about Jimmy Butler making coffee. <laughs> right and then selling the coffee because the coffee was that terrible um so i i just think that the amenities <laughs> right that, <laughs> that camp, camp coffee is always the worst coffee it, it uh, is <laughs> yeah so i think that again the the um everything that you're accustomed to doing they're creatures of habit all of these sports players um you know the personal side of things was rough on them i mean the coaches couldn't bring people into the bubble think about that Mm-mm. That that that's craziness too. So uh, there were competitive disadvantages uh, across the board for all. I don't think an asterisk needs to be put there. And and I think if it's if there is an asterisk to Kerry's point, it's because it was a little bit tougher. So I, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I, you make a good argument as far as like how tough it was. Now I, I wasn't really ever arguing that it was a difficult situation. I'm just saying that you put one season next to another season, you can't match stats. You can't. No. Like everything's skewed. So it, it if it's not an asterisk, it's an exception. It's a it's the strike the strike shortened season of ninety nine for basketball. Or um what was ninety five that the the baseball had the, the strike shortened season where the Yankees got knocked out. I think so. Um, yeah, right before they had the dynasty. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's weird. Um the uh the the whole thing with COVID right now, and and you guys you guys know I don't you know I don't know how much I share it on the air, but I'm I'm like athletic director, athletic coordinator is the job that I do during the day, and um, trying to get high school athletics set up right now in any state, Washington or New York or whatever. Um, with all the sports, there's so many different considerations that you have to make, and you know when thinking about like trying to put together a postseason, which we're in for. You know, we were we were in for basketball and and for baseball on those like truncated terms or shortened terms. It's difficult, and football is different than all that because you can only play one game in a week. Yep. Um, you know, and and w- with baseball, I think that what they've shown like five games in five days is it's a different Rubik's cube. Yeah. You know, like you you're you're not. You're not making decisions the same way you would make in, um, you know, travel days and yep. all the things that are involved in that. So pitching, yeah, everybody's in the in the bubble in San Diego, I guess, and or you know whatever. I, I haven't I haven't honestly been paying that much attention to baseball. I start I started watching the Yankee series like at the end, um, but between all the college football I have on DVR. And um, you know, and and day to day stuff. I haven't. I didn't watch a whole lot of baseball. Baseball didn't really excite me um, in the format that they're putting it out. I don't know about you guys, but the you know the cardboard cutouts and, <laughs> and it, 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 it felt it, it always felt kind of like a scrimmage. Um, and when football gets off of like the the Madden view it it feels like that too like like it's almost like a it's the westbury scrimmage before the first game for baldwin you know 
So, Kyle, oh, gosh. Do, and you've mentioned this a couple of times. Do you feel like this is a complete waste of a season getting back to the NFL and the New York Jets? All right. So if we were talking about like from a Joe Douglas point of view, you know, going back to when we weren't sure what kind of season we were going to have. Um, yeah, I, I, I've always felt that way. I felt like you you don't want to mortgage your long term success for a um, for a season like this. Uh, I, I don't I think that the Patriots are the, the number one case in point with that, whereas they they had so many guys opt out. They they didn't really retool all their positions based on that. They brought in Cam Newton for the prove it deal. Um, and they've had, you know, COVID issues. Um, where, whereas they, they, they've looked pretty good when they've played. Um, I, I think that that's the way they've gone about it. And I think with Joe Douglas too, he's not going to go out and, um, and spend and commit to some of those free agent things that we were complaining about um, because of that. It doesn't feel good necessarily, but I think that uh, I think that you got to have your eyes towards whatever's coming next because whatever's coming next will probably be the the actual new status quo. I think right now is kind of like an in between. Well, look, my my opinion is that in terms of you know your last comment regarding the Jets and Douglas, I think he he in fact you know didn't want to spend the kind of money that he might have been inclined to spend in a whole season, you know, an un, 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 uninterrupted um, pre-COVID, post-COVID season. And I think part of what you're seeing now is a result of that, mm-hmm. the product that's on the field. Yep. And, and not not signing, you know, several pass rushers that were on the free agent market, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not going after others that were, um, you know, under contract that were available. Uh, so, you know, a, a receiver, no. Um, a running back, not so much. But, um, you know, it, we've been impacted s- severely with regard to our um, management, you know, um, not seeing this as a season that uh, they're vested in as much as some, maybe right. some of these other, other teams are. Yep. So um, is, is, will, will there be an asterisk after the, the season? Sure. Well, I, I think I think it I think it will be undeserved in terms of how it will look to uh, in history as a championship for whoever wins it, uh, because everybody is under the same structure, under the same rules. Um, you know, we lost C.J. Mosley, which is pretty the most the, the most impactful um, player on our defense. Jamal, uh, Jamal Adams is just, not that guy? Is not well, the most? well when, I, when I say that, I'm talking about, you know, who we had available to, for us to play. And I think, I think Jamal Adams is, is, is part of that um, decision that this is not going to be a um, vested season for them in terms yeah. of financial investment. Well, so a couple of things for me. Um, and I, and by the way, he he didn't receive a contract when he got traded. Sure. And he's on, and he's on the bench, hurt. And no. and even when he was in there, Seattle was giving up 400 yards a game, anyway. Um, Good point. So yeah. what what kind of impact was he indeed making on the field? And I think he probably made more of an impact for us as far as a leader. Right. Right. So I don't want to disparage him in that way. No, no, you know, no. saying that he's not he's not the player. But what I'm saying is that I think they valued other things more than signing him to a um, a deal that would have hamstrung them um, going forward. You guys think we have more wins right now if Jamal Adams is on the team? No. Neither do I. No, no, no. And I don't think anybody is, is um, you know, judging that trade and saying that we wouldn't make that trade every single day of the week. I, I don't think so. But it, you can't not have a conversation about the impact that it's made on our defense and it looking so poorly to date 
and feeling like there's no leadership out there in order to try to rectify that on the field. So I we, yeah, we went from thinking we have a good defense to thinking we have a, a, a maybe possibly a defense that's worse than our offense. Correct. Correct. And that's hard to do since we are, have the worst <laughs> offense in the NFL. So there's Very nowhere nice. else to go. When you look at backwards, you're like, all right, there's nobody behind me. I'm the, I'm the last player <laughs> pick. Number 33. <laughs> you know, you and, know, <laughs> you know and, and what I will say too, is when you, when you look at the offense, I mean, look at the defense, Again, what what wasn't addressed the way in which it should have been or would have been in a vested season is the cornerback position. And we are we have to be at, at least in the bottom third in um, cornerback play. So listen, and I'll say this. Free agency and the draft, free agency in, in particular, draft a little bit different. Free agency occurred before COVID and before we understood the impact of it which mm-hmm. means the DeAndre Hopkins trade as an example happened in the middle of March mm-hmm. as an example. So Joe Douglas from a free agency perspective. Yeah. But the middle of March was, we were thick in the, in the, you know, shutting stuff down. No, 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 we weren't yet. We didn't know what it was until April until like later no, on in that, March, in that week. Until, no, no, March, March, we, they were shutting stuff down in March. March 13th is when school, school shut down. For school yeah. shut. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that. But at that point in time, did we understand the impact? We didn't even understand what symptoms to look for on March 13th. We just knew that there was a problem somewhere, right? We didn't understand the full impact of it. Um, mortality rates, all of those the, things, the social, because again, we didn't, China wasn't communicating as, as much and they were where, Ground zero was mm-hmm. of that epidemic, yeah. right? So I, I say all that to say, and I don't want to get into all the, the science around into it. Into the weeds. Right, yeah. into the weeds around it. But I, Joe Douglas at that point in time was implementing a plan that didn't have COVID-19 as part of it. So <laughs> when when he made the decisions to sign the um, you know, the the offensive line that he did and put that together. I mean that that was that had nothing to do with COVID. Yeah, that I, had nothing to do with COVID. Uh, and I and, and I and I think that he, that I think that the offensive line moves were just we need to show up our offensive line. You know, we're going to get McGovern. We're going to get these guys that that are have proven to have some proven success. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with money per se. I, I think, think that had to do I with we need to improve our front offensive line. I think it absolutely did. Going, going I think our starting it. offensive line is bad. It's 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 the uh, I, I think the moves. In your question phrasing, the moves to stir up the old line were good moves. The injuries are what's really hurting. Right. Even with our starting, right. or even with all five starters in there, the the people that have been out have been the tackles, and the tackles have performed well. The yeah. center of our line right now, center and guards, again, which Joe Douglas signed, haven't performed well, haven't enough. performed well enough at all. Um, and again, Kerry, to to your point, the cornerbacks. We we never at went into or at the end of free agency said, you know what, um, Joe Douglas spent Robbie Anderson as a perfect example. But, you know, again, we don't know how much was offered. You know, we there was some things that came out that um, um, Michael Irvin that he had called Michael Irvin crying saying he wanted to stay with the Jets, but, you know, decided to go with the Panthers. Who knows, you know, how valid that is at the end of the day. But when you when you look at it. When you looked at what he spent, you never said, you know what, Joe Douglas spent enough or or he overspent or, you know what, he spent enough. I don't think he spent enough. I, I just, you know, when you look at it right now, De- DeAndre Hopkins trade, you could take that for what it is. Did we, we still don't have going into next season, the skill players we need, maybe not the offensive line we need, definitely not, not the corners we need. We need so many things at the end of the day. Do we, even with the treasure trove of draft picks that we have and the money we have to spend, are we going to be able to fill all those holes? Yeah, that's going to be a, that's a, that's a then, then And then it becomes a, you, you're going to fill the holes, but you, you got, you got to have time to gel and yeah. um, you're going to have a bunch of rookies on your roster um, be, as a result of, you know, utilizing those draft picks. And then you got to make the decision if you're going to stay with the quarterback. Yep. And and if you don't, the amount of draft picks that you're going to get is a result of that too. So, or or you package those up and you go get some veterans, you know, off you know 
you fleece another roster. Um, but yeah, so you know, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough call to determine whether or not um, definitively this should be considered a um, season with an asterisk after it if everybody's playing with the same set of rules. Um, because at the like I said, at the end of the day, when you when it comes down to it, and you and you are holding up that that uh, Lombardi Trophy, you're not gonna care if there's an asterisk after your your your, <laughs> nah. your season or not. Nah, and I, and if I'm a Jet fan and they won, I wouldn't give two you know what. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> send me the replica. When Kansas City wins again, it'll just be back to back. Again, All right? Mm. When Patrick mm. Patrick Mahomes, who should be our quarterback? No, oh, here we go. there we go. All here right, so, go. so you want to talk about quarterbacks, man? You want to talk about quarterbacks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, let's let's ask this question today with Donald out. Will Flacco make a difference? Any difference at all? What I would say is yes. What I saw last week um, was Darnold missing a lot of open receivers, overthrowing or um, just holding the ball too long. Yep. Or, you know, trying to scramble when he could not get out of the way of whoever was trying to tackle him. You know, he made some great plays. You know, he's he's like to to a certain extent, he's like the gunslinger that um that Brett Favre was, you know, early on in his career. Now, I, you know, I take I take Brett Brett Favre's career, um, if that's what Darnold turns out to be, but at the end of the day, we don't know what's going on right now, and if 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 past performance is an indicator of of future performance, then right now he's not that dude. Mm. So we need to get him. Like, we need to like get him. It. Hedge fund, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, you know my bottom, finance. Right? You know my finance background. <laughs> so, um, you know what? I, I hope. I hope. So, so my my thing is is that I hope that Flacco can at least show him the way of what he's not doing because Flacco is not going to be reliant on his ability to escape the pocket at no, all. No. So. Um, he's going to be he's going to be more reliant on his ability to see the play developing and hitting the the receiver the when he anticipates being open. So I'm hoping that that's that's what occurs during this particular game. I'll make a prediction. If if the Jets if the Jets play well today on offense, Le'Veon Bell will have seven plus catches, and five of them will come on checkdowns from Flacco. Because if if we know anything about Flacco, he's a pro, um, a pro style quarterback, um, knowledgeable in the the Bible of of NFL offenses, which is really it's the same offense with different words and uh and different types of play callers. So you might have Andy Reid, you know, running a, you know, a cool, uh, you know, trick play or, 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 or variation or something like that, or McVay, but the, the essence of all those plays are the same. Right. Um, because they, they really, and we've talked about this before, if you sign somebody off the street on Tuesday and you need that person to play on Sunday, they need to be able to understand what to do in the most basic way. So, you can't have like you can't just have like a different offense at every place. So it's kind of like stock cars, but some people drive the car better. Um, I think that Flacco is going to be a checkdown king if they're successful today. And Le'Veon, the thing that that we've always complained about is that we don't we don't utilize Le'Veon enough as a receiver. And um, when he was getting a hundred thousand touches a game. In Pittsburgh, they were not all coming on runs. A lot of them were coming on passes, and yeah, and very similar to Tomlinson in that you know if Le'Veon's going to have a great season, he's rushing for two thousand yards and he's catching a hundred balls. Um, you know, wh- I don't think he'll ever get to that point again in his career, but I'll take 
you know, what did he, he had 66 catches last year in a bad year? Yeah, he can get back there. Uh, I, you know, it just depends on who's at the helm as far as head coach, offensive yeah. coordinator, and quarterback. Now, my question for, for you guys is, yeah. let's say, you know, because we have, and it, it's tough to really say that because we're the New York Jets, we have two relatively winnable games over the next two games. We have Arizona, which didn't look winnable up until last week because they didn't really look that great. And then you have the Chargers with a rookie quarterback who's looked awesome, by the way, um, totally different from the quarterback that we have that we drafted number three um, in the Chargers the following week. Now, Flacco goes out there and gets two W's, you know, and, and, and doesn't light it up. Let's not say he scored 400 yards and four touchdowns in each game, but let's say he ends up, you know, 2-0 and in those games. Do you put Donald back out there? Yes, if 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 he's only you lost his to. spot to injury, then yes. I mean, if he's if he's lost, Kyle looks like he froze there. Right, and not not only that, and I agree with Kyle, but not only that, but you have to put him back out there to evaluate him. You know, you have to see what he can do so you can prepare for what you're going to do next year. So if you're if you're the Bears, as an example, right? Because I think that they had this exact choice where they oh yeah rolled with Nick Foles right, right? And, yeah and so and think about it Super Bowl winning quarterback right um yeah you know has been a backup last couple of years mm -hmm. uh and now you feel like he is your better option to win football games right and instead of enduring loss after loss because you feel like Trubisky is not although drafted high and traded away other draft players, other uh, draft picks in order to get him, moved up, right? Um, right. Benched him and said, you know what? This is our best opportunity to win games. Never mind evaluating the kid at this point. We need mm -hmm. to win football games. Right. Um, I, I feel like, you know, if I'm if I'm flack, if I'm um Gase, and this guy puts two wins on the board and he looks good doing it, why am I going to roll back to Donald? You know what? Roll back to Donald. Why? Why don't you sit there and, and evaluate and actually learn a little bit by sitting down and watching this this guy play? Now, if if Flacco turns around and, and turns in a couple of bad games in a row, you go back to Donald. Because to me, I've seen enough tape on Donald in order to, to, to have some sort of evaluation. I'd love to have all the weapons in the world and the best offensive line in the world. But um, if Flacco is going to roll out there with, with the same group and put some wins on the board, why am I going to go back to Donald until I feel like he's either... <laughs> 200% and or Flacco starts to stumble. I'll let you let you continue, Kyle, because you got cut off there. No, I, I'm, I think I'm having a couple of uh, issues here with Zoom. But, yeah, I, I, I think that um, even if – even with Gates calling the offense, I think that there are more checkdowns available for Sam Darnold than he took. Yep. Um, and totally. uh, and I, I think that – I think that – Flacco, if he plays well, and I'm putting that caveat there, if he plays well, um, then it'll be because he took those checkdowns and because he kept the ball moving, because he got first downs and everything like that. Um, I remember, uh, I, I remember when he came out of out of uh, University of Delaware, Brian's Brian's alma mater, Blue Hands, um, Blue, Hens. Blue Hens, baby. Yeah, it may, it makes me think, Brian, of the story when uh, Boston University played uh, Delaware our freshman year, and uh, and we got to say hello to each other real quick um, at the game. And I had traveled to that game only because I had I was the scout team player of the week, so the scout team player of the week got okay. to travel. Okay. And I got to I got to wear the hat on the sideline <laughs> and, and chart the plays. And we got so smacked, like Tubby Raymond, Wing T, yep. Del Delaware, classic Delaware smacking somebody. Yep. Uh, Boston Boston University got killed. And we we bust it from Boston to Delaware. Mm. So that bus ride home was horrible. Pretty, pretty miserable. <laughs> oh, it was totally! It was totally miserable, and that's the only time. That was the only time that we, that I think that we played Delaware while I was playing. We had Actually, a program. 
we got a program. We have players, yeah. man. When I came there, I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to walk on to, you know, Delhi, you know. <laughs> I was like, you know, what kind of program do they have? I came out there. I'm like, these guys can really play football, man. And yeah. they were they were a winning program. And throughout the four years that I was there, they won a lot of games, had some good players, um, had some NFL players drafted. Um, Flacco came after. I believe I Gannon, was there. Gannon, yeah. Gannon was a couple of years before us. Yes. Right? Yes. Gannon, uh, Rich Gannon for the Raiders. He was a couple uh-huh. years before us. Uh, Joe Flacco came a couple years after us. I think he was more 97, 98, something like that. So I just missed Flacco, him. Flacco played at Delaware when, after they changed the offense. So, you know, the, the Delaware no wing T mm-hmm. yeah, the Delaware wing T is called the Delaware wing T because, Tubby Raymond at Delaware was the originator of the office. Right. Um, so the um, and Tubby Raymond coached while we were in college and then retired shortly after shortly that. Thereafter, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then it became a a wide open air raid pro style or whatever it was. And Flacco was, I think Flacco transferred to Delaware from somewhere else. I think so. Yeah. And um, we all have heard the stories of how. Joe Douglas loved Joe Flacco and that's like one of his claims to fame is like, you know, he had done the scouting report on Joe Flacco. He was the area scout for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, uh, the guy from Delaware is going to start today and, and off a of neck surgery hasn't played in, in a year. Um, right. Didn't, didn't play well in Denver. Nope. Um, so the it'll be it'll remain to be seen if he plays well it'll be because he used Le'Veon Bell in the check down game a lot so that that's that's my prediction over under receptions for Le'Veon Bell if he's over six receptions we win the game I mean you know my what I would also want to uh bring to mind is that we had two receivers that were either close to 100 yard receiving games or over hard over a hundred yard receiving um last week against denver and that was um crowder and jeff smith wasn't wasn't herndon no oh. that's it you know <laughs> oh, don't get me started on that one that's that's a whole nother segment we can get into um missing balls and you know ridiculous he's supposed to be your 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 um up and coming your life jacket yeah, man you know it's terrible and 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 him and who's what's the other um the other ryan, tight end ryan griffin right the guy that you spent money on like neither, neither of these dudes have had their name called enough so mm-hmm. so my point is this is that i want jeff smith to start over hogan at this point and you know use burials as much as you can as well we have enough we have enough talent right now that we could at least um get some balls in the air and we got to go deep like there's no there is no i don't know the last time i saw a play action with this offense like it it makes no sense to me it makes absolutely no sense to me do mims or perriman play? i know perriman isn't playing does mims play today no i think he's still on mm-hmm. ir right now so he hasn't even made it off of that in order to to be eligible to play um, so, and that's a disappointment, obviously, if the kids hurt, it's a hamstring, man, this is so long for a hamstring. Sometimes, right. some, sometimes it's like a week and a half, two weeks. Sometimes it's like six weeks, depending on the severity of the injury. But, you know, do we have any screens in our arsenal? Do we have it? I, I haven't, it's, it, I've watched a lot of football and I'm, I'm looking at, um, you know, even, uh, Clemson, I was watching them where, you know, um, Trevor Lawrence rolls to the right. The offensive line doesn't move. Then all of a sudden they throw a screen to the left and then they have all five offensive linemen running in front of the guy. And right. I'm like, well, there's nothing that we can do that's creative like that. I mean, I, I watch a lot of football and I see some creative plays. That I feel like every five, ten minutes and we do nothing. We just Again. straight up forward, which obviously to me is, is, is um indicative of Gase. But listen, Gate, this is more so – Gase and whether or not he's the issue or is it Donald and these next two games are going to somewhat prove that that so I have the injury report up and um, 
Fant is not on the injury report. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that means that that he'll probably start at right tackle. Um, Perriman is, but Mims is not. Um, on the injury report. Yeah, and and I'm I'm wondering if this does not include IR. IR. Probably um, not. I'm I'm not I as concerned. That Perriman was on IR though. Perm is not yeah. on IR. He wasn't on IR. What was he on then? He was just injured. They were hoping that he was going to come back. So, and then he he just hasn't. They could have put him on IR, but he's been out so long. Mm-hmm. It just is what it is. Um, right. So you can't re- because he's not on the IR. You can't replace him on on the roster. Is that it? Correct. He's just he's not going to be active today, but you only have a certain amount of players that you can put on the active roster. So he'll he'll he's part of the fifty three. But he just right. won't be active today. Right. Well, so my point is that he's taking up a roster spot so yeah. for somebody that we could call up. Yeah. So yep. I guess the, so my point is that they, that they must have hopes that he is going to return shortly then. Or the potential the potential for it. If you remember, and I tell people this all the time, um the receiver for the giant, Odell Beckham, that he started out his career on the on the injured list. Hundred percent. Because of his his hamstring 100%, issues, hundred percent, and he couldn't get on the field. Um, the, I think it was the first five, four or five games of his of his rookie season. Yeah, he looked like a bust early on, right? Right. So you know, I'm not as concerned about it because I don't I don't think Mims has that kind of hamstring history. Um, but let's but let's talk about you know Gase. Um, let's dive deeper into this to this Gase thing. I, I've heard that. He, he did some things differently in terms of improvement, um, improvements in practice, um, an increase in intensity. <laughs> Is that going to have any impact on this game? Increase in intensity. Are you going to change your play calling? That's what I want to see an increase in, a change in the, in, in, in the, in the play calling. That is what will have an impact on uh, whether we win or lose this game. If you keep doing the same things and, and you're not having any type of play action where you're fooling or or, or having the um the the linebackers uh you yeah, know go in one direction the and then go into the next and freeze the linebackers or like you said um you know screen plays that are creative I don't see any creativity in this offense at all. Changing practice uh, and making it more intense. Uh, things, things, things like that are that's intense. That, that, those, that, that's the definition of moves that you make that's when desperate. there are no other moves to make. Desperate. Yeah. I mean, I've been in that position before where you're on a, you're on a losing clip, and uh, you got to shake things up because otherwise, if you do, if you continue to do things the way that they're going, it just it feels perpetual. So you have to have something that knocks it off that perpetual cycle, maybe like restart the mojo a little bit, um, and that's all that really is. I mean, is it gonna change? Is it gonna change game operation? Is it gonna change um, decision making? Uh, you know, it, I don't. I think that's it's what he had to do. I mean, there's he had no other choice than to change. Because if he doesn't change something when everything isn't working, then you're then you're as good as gone. You're you're, you're lame duck walking dead. Well, he's already lame duck, Donald. Duke right, or, he's or already Daffy. gone. Well, but what I would say is that listen, it, it's not just the offense that's probably you know ranked thirty two. It's the defense too that's ranked thirty two, and a lot of it has to do with tackling. Um, so I I think this is more about the defense than it is about the offense as far as the intensity is concerned. Um, you know, the offense for me is play calling and execution. I think the defense is just flat out, you know, mano y mano. I'm just getting whooped out here on defense and I'm, I'm not making, um, you know, fit in the gaps like you, you, you were mentioning, Kyle, during uh, a lot of the text exchanges that we were having and um, just tackling the man in front of you, right? The ball carrier at the end of the day, especially against San Francisco. I mean, we, we looked totally overmatched 
um, in that scenario. So I, I think Le'Veon Bell coming back will help, um, you know, depending on how Gase uses him. Depending on, to your point with the checkdowns, how mm-hmm. Flacco uses him. Are you going to actually throw him the ball? Um, or are you going to try to fit something into a tight window where there's nothing there? So uh, um, I guess, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. Can't imagine Gase looking good after this game. I don't think we win. I don't see a path forward for beating the Cardinals because of more so because of their offense than um, than our offense and how bad it's going to look. Because right. who is ta- going to cover Hopkins? Who is going to cover? Who's going to tackle Kyler Murray? Can, can, can we can we say that? Who's going to tackle that guy? He makes mm. <laughs> full defenses look horrendous. So, mm. you know, us going out there having tackling issues, going against a quarterback that can, you know, shake shake you out of your boots is not really a recipe for success at the end of the day. I don't see a path forward for us winning unless Flacco plays out of his mind. That's the only thing that that's the the wild card that could be there. Him and Le'Veon go and say, hey, we're going we're going to put it on our shoulders. We're going to take on the world, man. We winners out here. We're going to we're going to show up. Other than that, I can't see a path forward for us winning this game. Mm. Mm. I feel like they, I feel like the Cardinals have a good quarterback and they have um, three to four good receivers so that even if you did cover Hopkins, um, there's lots of other ways, you know, six million ways to ch- die, choose one. Uh, <laughs> but uh wow. the, uh, the I, uh the thing with um with defense too is that you know like the nfl nfl defenses are built to either have a pass rush or, or put pressure on a quarterback to which they have to throw off platform or before they want to they're going to get hit and they're going to feel pressure um and you and you have the defensive backfield that can either play zone coverage or tight man to make that happen. And usually if you're playing the man coverage, it means that that generation of pass rush that you need to get has to come from more than four. Um, so every, every person you insert in the blitz game, you leave another person on an island. And the problem with the Jets offense fundamentally is that it has no – significant pass rush with its front with its with its three to four man front um they're handled pretty easily and quarterbacks sit back there and they yep. have time to make a sandwich and you know <laughs> uh, some sweet tea and sit down and have a picnic make some grits but, make some grits there. <laughs> sure <laughs> easy biscuits um but but that's the thing like and if you can't do it with with your primary pass rushers, you don't have edge pressure. You got to add one linebacker. Then you got to add two linebackers. Then all of a sudden you get into coverages that are either man free or, uh, you know, some, some sort of zero. Um, And a guy like Deandre Hopkins, a guy like Larry Fitzgerald, uh, Christian Kirk, Andy Isabella, you know, name it. They got, they got a lot of dudes over there. They are they are going to kill you in man coverage because we do not have one single guy who is considered a, a premier cover guy. It was great when you had Antonio Cromartie and, and Darrell Rivas because you could get exotic. Rex Ryan had the ability to get exotic, but we just we just simply do not generate enough pass rush with our front, and because of that, and we don't have good DVs. So I mean, it's it's a recipe for bad defense. And then we don't tackle well, you know, so. Oh, and then there's that. <laughs> and then there's that, <laughs> that little thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen today? Oh, you can predict it. What's the line today? <laughs> yeah, what is the line today? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to look it up, though. Um, Yeah, man, <laughs> it, it's – uh. Sorry, state of affairs, man. I, you know, if we don't win today, um, I definitely don't think we beat the Chargers. Then you got the Bills, and you got a couple other teams coming in to whoop up on us, man. It's uh, it's not good, not good. What might be a better bet than looking at the line is shorting the Jets and betting whether they'll go oh 
and 16. Um, because that that looks like a bigger possibility right now than two wins. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think that they're going to win a game in the division at this point, unless they put unless they play fifty percent better than than they have. So you'd have to, you'd have to get you'd have to get to a point before you could really honestly say that they'll beat Miami or or Buffalo or New England. I mean, they might not ever play New England because who knows what will happen with all the, the virus. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's interesting you said, and I didn't hear this uh, before you said it earlier, Brian, that the Broncos had some COVID cases considering that's the last team we played. So um, maybe part of this false positive thing came from being nervous about that. Or maybe Manish Meta was the one that reported it, and it was just you know, <laughs> and it was just wrong. It was just an outright yeah, lie. Right. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> he, has, he has no no credentials. No, I wouldn't no take that bet on no a passport. They took his passport away. I wouldn't take that bet on an Owen sixteen. I mean, we we still gonna get some players back. We 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 don't have Beckton. Um, you know, we hopefully Perriman and Mims at some point come back. Um, you know, what's going on with Ashton Davis? He has a groin injury. He's that, not that, on the that's IR. gonna that's gonna take a long time. Um, you know, with the groin injuries, you know, you they, you're slow to come back because they don't want you to keep re injuring it. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't I just I just I guess the optimist in me feels like we're going to win a game. And put some type of string together. Do you guys know who the most optimistic coach is in in all of sports? Pete Carroll. No, uh, no. There's this guy's got Pete Carroll uh, beat. It's it's this new show on Apple TV called Ted Lasso. And uh, I don't know if you guys have Apple TV or not, but <laughs> is he a soccer coach or something? He, so the the story of the show it's it's basically major league repurposed the story okay so like somebody you know woman gets divorced and she gets her the, the 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 soccer club that her and her husband had and and she gets it in the divorce and she wants to run it in the ground so what she does is she hires a football coach an american football coach to come to england and coach a soccer team a european football team and I, you know my my son's like oh let's watch this show let's watch this show i'm like this show looks stupid Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't want to watch it. It is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> and, um, and case in point is he's, he's, he's yelling at one of the soccer players for being a prima donna. And he, he goes into a rant and he, and it, it, it becomes the Allen Iverson practice rant. <laughs> and nobody knows what he's talking about. Cause they're all, uh, you know, they're all young and from England, but he's like, we're talking about practice talking about not the game not the game and my son is 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 laughing but he doesn't know why he's laughing I'm right like, right you know that's alan iverson right and then we went back to youtube last night and we watched that he's like oh my god it's it's word for word um and uh i i, I hadn't watched the alan iverson thing in a while and it really is ridiculous like he goes on for 15 <laughs> minutes all right like i i but um yeah, we kind of need maybe we need Ted Lasso to come in and be the coach of the Jets because uh, he's super positive. You can't get Ted Lasso down. Um, but I, I, I would if you want if you want to laugh, uh, maybe after a Jet game, after things are not going so well, um, I would recommend Ted Lasso. It's pretty funny. Or maybe during the game, like at halftime, in order to keep you <laughs> <laughs> keep keep you coming back for more. Like, all right, I, I can stomach the second half and I, I think that the new york jets would be the ultimate challenge of this lasso guy um trying to keep him positive <laughs> throughout the season it might, it might, it, it might, it break might just him. it might just kill ted lasso it might break him in. right i can i can just i can just hear gay saying you talking about practice it's like about practice i think we i think we were talking about it offline i was telling brandon about it last night and you know like one of the english guys says says Cheers to him, and he and he replies with Nycord. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I was like, no way, that's funny.
That's funny. For this 46 year old angry Jet fan, that's funny. <laughs> Well, you know, some of you, some of you fans who are Yankee fans are pretty upset yeah. about, you know, the last day or so. That was a really good game. That, game. that was a, that was a great game. Yeah. It, would, it would have been a better game if you were on the other side of the, uh, of the uh, equation. Sure. Winning. Sure. Um, it, it, it's, it's rough when you pitch your ace, when you have your ace ready to go and you don't win the game in the playoff series. <clears throat> And your ace and your top relievers at that. Yeah. Like you put everything out there as far as your A number one team in order to win. What's disappointing is that with runners in scoring position, we couldn't hit anything. We only had three hits in this game. Um, and I, I, wow. I knew when it was 1 1, like we're going to lose this game at the end of the day because we're not going to, we weren't going to get the hit. We weren't going to get the key hit. We focus too much on the long ball and rely on that. And if the home run doesn't happen, then it, it really doesn't bode well for us and doesn't bode well for us in these games. And to have your closer give up game-clinching home runs against the Rays and against the Astros, it's tough to, to swallow, man. You don't right. know where to go from there, right? Because right? that's who you need at that point in time. Right. And for that to occur two years, not in a row, right? Because last year I don't think that's what it was. But yeah. um, but two out of the last three years, it's it's tough, man. Where do you go from here? You know? I think that um I think that, you know, nine times out of ten, you're somebody like Chapman is going to get you what you need. Mm -hmm. So you wanna you wanna have you wanna ride a starter, but I think Cole pitched seven innings or something like that. You know, you ride your starter as long he as you can. He pitched six. He pitched six. Six, yeah. yeah. Like he 90 pitches, 93 something. pitches or something like that. Yeah, so 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 you get him there. You get to that you get to the Zach Britons and 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 the like and then you get to Chapman. Chapman yeah. And 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 your like your your whole model is defensively is built on getting to that point and getting over the hump with that quality closer. I think it was the either the, fifth inning or the seventh inning that they had a two out rally on a Hicks single then Stanton got walked and Boyd struck out yep and I think like that's where that's where I was like yeah if they if they can't do it there you know they're, they're, that they're, they're, they're in trouble here so I mean uh, but the, the, the thing about it back. too is that you know Chapman was pitching for a hold he wasn't really pitching for a save right mm -hmm. so you know your mentality is not necessarily the same although it should be um but you know when he's when you have him on the mound at that point in time or that that time in the game you know your expectation is that you know he's going to hold here and then we're going to hit a home run but what happened was it was the opposite he's not going to hold and they hit a run home, a home run off of us well you think you think about all those great '90s uh, Yankees teams that won championships. Um, you didn't always have live bats necessarily, but you had guys like Brocious and Paul O'Neill that could like grind in at bat, like you know, 12, 11, 12 pitch at bats, where like it's a full count for like the last five pitches, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're just fouling things <laughs> off and, and you're like oh man th this pitcher he's got nothing else to throw except something that this guy's gonna hit yeah or he's gonna walk or he's gonna walk him because these guys have such plate discipline but what the yankees are built on now is is power power and more power right and uh if that power doesn't um come and, through and, and, and if yeah. it doesn't come through it's a strikeout Right. So so that's where yeah. it ends up even worse because you don't advance the runners at all. Um, you don't force a ball into play where it could be an error or turn into anything else at that point. But a strikeout is just the worst. It's it's either it's a, the the second worst under a double play. <laughs> right? Because then you don't don't advance the runners. Um I mean just nothing positive happens at that point in time. 
Uh, and then yeah. it's a, it's uplifting for the other team and the pitcher gives them the confidence at that point in time. Cause there's nothing that they love more than to strike, you know, that player out at the end of the day. So, you know, mentally, I think it's, it's, it's crushing too. Uh, but I, we, we got a lot to look at. So to your point, Kyle, I think that when you look at the Rays, they look like the Yankees of, you know, the late nineties, mid nineties, right. When they and were they're running. built like that too. And yeah. that's what they're built. Like how we were grinding out at bats, some no name players or players that we kind of grab from other teams that will put the ball in play and, and move runners along. We just can't manufacture runs unless it's a home run. And again, the opposite side of a home run is a strikeout. And um, yep. we just have too many strikeout, um, you know, players or hitters in our lineup at this point in time. We, we have a lot of cleaning up to do. Gary Sanchez, um, he's got to be gone. I don't, I don't see a world mm. where we, we move forward with him in our lineup because um, he was one of the worst culprits. He was basically useless during the entire playoffs. Wow. Yeah. Right. Higashio, what's his name? Higgy? Yeah. I mean, however you want to pronounce it. But, I mean, he was clearly the better player. Wasn't totally. even. It was, it was, I mean, you look, you look at the stats and you talk about his his batting average, his his run scored, his even his defense his at times. His defense time. is much better. Right? So, you know, I, I, what do you do with him? What do you do with Gary Sanchez? Trade him. Yeah. You, uh. you have to. You, you trade him. To, to me, uh-huh. you, you trade him for a, a reliever or a young um, starting pitcher. One of my coworkers have been talking about uh, have been talking about Higgy for for last for the last five years since he was in the minors. They were talking about this kid, mm-hmm. so you know, now is at the time that they had. It actually, it was the same time that they had Sanchez when he first came up, and um, who was the other pitcher that they that they let go this year at the end of last year? Talking about the Yankees. Yeah, but the, I mean, excuse, not pitcher, catcher. Oh. Oh, um, I know what you're talking about. He retired recently too. Uh, Cervelli. Cervelli. Yeah. No, no, not, not, not Cervelli. Cervelli. After Cervelli. Forgot his name. Romine. Romine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Romine. Yeah. I mean, he to me he was a he was a good yeah a good catcher. You yeah. know, I was I was hopeful that the that the uh, Mets were gonna go after him, but you know that's neither here nor there. We don't. Let's not even discuss. How, how does the Mets do in their series? Really. Did they have a really? series? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> they were hitting the cover off the ball. They just couldn't pitch a lick. Oh my God. It's totally contrary to what they're all about. Stro- right. <laughs> Stroman, Stroman decided that he didn't want to play. And then, you know, Thor, you know, decided that, you know, his uh Quad? his uh had to have Tommy John surgery. So uh, you know, that was the end of I'm that. Gonna, I'm gonna say something really nice about the Mets right now. Okay. Uh-oh. City Field has some of the best food um, <laughs> ever. It does, it yeah, does. ever, it does. ever. They got Blue Smoke barbecue at City Field. Mm-hmm. I'll take the flight. I'll take the flight back to uh, to LaGuardia. Just take the cab over to City Field. Get 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 some food. Yeah. Get back on the flight. Go over to back over to Seattle. One fell swoop. It's all right there, man. The sausage is over there too. They got a whole bunch of good food over there, man. I'm ready. There's so much good food in Queens that um there was a, a shawarma place that was that was by me in Kew Gardens that um that people used to get in cabs on layovers and go out of security and back through security so they could go get this shawarma sandwich on Main Street in Kew Gardens Hills. And uh it was worth every probably penny that they paid for it too. You could take all the pickles with you, like uh, like Ben's Deli. It's good. Yeah. Talk. About, we should start a food show. That that that's a, a whole nother avenue for us. Whole nother. Uh, I'm chubby. En- I'm chubby enough, man. I can't. You know, <laughs> having a whole food program. <laughs> Forget about it. All right, Carrie, what you got, man? That's it, man. You guys got anything else? Do we have a uh, we we have a prediction? Anybody want to? Oh, bandy about a score prediction for today. I'm I don't I'm not gonna bandy about a score prediction. I'm gonna bandy that um Joe Flacco is gonna have significant success and we're gonna lose the game <laughs> because our defense, you know, can't uh can't hold anybody. 
21 Cardinals. 35-21. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to go uh, 28-17. 28-17 Cardinals. 28-17 Cardinals. You get a lot more confidence in the defense than I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I say the Cardinals make an error, you know, self-inflicted. Clearly not something that we did, but, you know, mm. 28. We, we keep them in the ballpark a little bit. You're, you're saying we get uh, pick six this year instead of um, oh, no, behind? No, no. This year will be on the sidelines with broken ankles by the time the second quarter comes around. Mm. Yeah, he'll have wobbly knees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But hey, guys, hey, thanks. Thanks, audience, for watching another episode of the BK BK podcast. We want to be able to keep bringing you the latest news and viewpoints of where sports and the culture collide and the New York Jets reign supreme. So keep watching. You can find us on Facebook on our BK BK podcast fan page, Twitter on BK on at BK BK podcast. Instagram at BK BK podcast, yeah. as well as on YouTube. Just type in BKBK podcast, hit the like and the describe, subscribe button to show the love. If you cannot watch us, you can just listen to us on iTunes. Go to the BKBK podcast, a podcast, podomatic.com. That's it. Let's go Jets. Let's go Bruins. And let's go team BKBK. That's right. Let's go.